From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Joe Biden stays up late to address the 2024 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. What did he say about his decision to drop out his legacy and why voters should send Kamala Harris to the Oval Office next? Plus, what's in the Democratic Party platform that delegates are voting on this week? And what is the state of the presidential race as we go into these final 75 or so days? Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by my colleague, columnist Kim Strassel. A career-capping speech for Joe Biden at the DNC amid chants of We Love Joe, but almost 11.30 on the East Coast when he took the stage, well after midnight when he finished past prime time which is probably less important in the streaming age, but still kind of an odd signal for the guy who was at the top of the Democratic ticket until not all that long ago, just a matter of weeks ago. Convention officials are blaming the slowdown on raucous applause, interrupting speaker after speaker, saying that they even skipped some elements in order to get Biden on the stage earlier. Let's listen to a piece of what he said, making the case that his accomplishments in his administration are also Kamala's. And I'm not exaggerating. Because of you, we've had one of the most extraordinary four years of progress ever, period. When I say we, I mean Kamala and me. Just think about it. COVID no longer controls our lives. We've gone from economic crisis to the strongest economy in the entire world. Also speaking on Monday, day one was Hillary Clinton. Just to provide some of the flavor of the convention hall, let's listen to a piece of that. As a prosecutor, Kamala locked up murderers and drug traffickers. She will never rest in defense of our freedom and safety. Donald Trump fell asleep at his own trial, and when he woke up, He made his own kind of history, the first person to run for president with 34 felony convictions. And here is Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We have a chance to elect a president who is for the middle class because she is from the middle class. She understands the urgency of rent checks and groceries and prescriptions. She is as committed to our reproductive and civil rights as she is to taking on corporate greed. And she is working tirelessly to secure a ceasefire in Gaza and bringing hostages home. Kim, what did you make of the day one proceedings and in particular the president's speech? One of the things he said was, that his best choice coming into office was choosing Kamala Harris as his vice president, which is a pretty strong endorsement and got a a great reaction from the crowd. Just a step back here, 30,000 feet, this had to have been a very difficult, if not agonizing night for Joe Biden. If you think about it, This was the rousing convention that he never got, because if you go back to 2020, obviously the the proceedings were largely shut down and canceled. There was no room of adoring fans. He obviously had expected that he was going to be up there on the stage this year as the nominee. Instead, all of this was applause was for his leaving, in essence, and kind of humiliating, too. Let's not forget he was put on Monday night so that he could be dealt with and then put in a cupboard somewhere until November. He was essentially asked to come and give his own eulogy. So it had to have been difficult for him. The speech itself was not surprising because it felt very much like any number of speeches that Joe Biden has given. The only thing that was different was the crowd, the hugeness of the crowd shouting for him. It was partly a recounting of his accomplishments with the usual spin on a lot of things that the fact checkers ought to be all over. It was partly an endorsement of Kamala because, of course, that was his job. And it was partly the usual slams of Donald Trump over January 6th and the abortion and threat to democracy. 
All of these things were things that we had have heard from Joe Biden in many, many variations before. We're going to rebuild the economy from middle class, bottom up, middle out, all of these phrases that have become part of his shtick. The difference, obviously, was the crowd there. Kamala did him the honor, as it were, of appearing on stage at the end. So her little bit of a nod to him passing the torch. The theater of the evening, I would just note a couple of fictions. One, all of these people out in the audience now saying, oh, the man was so selfless to get out and let the next generation come on. I mean, this was a guy he had to be dragged out by his boots to get him to go, you know, and then also all the shouts of thank you, Joe, and we love you, Joe. And I get why they might do that because he's he exited. But in terms of the legacy that he has left, a 39% approval rating, the policies that have really caused havoc for the Democratic Party, not sure there's really a great deal to thank him for. I generally agree with that assessment of the speech. One thing that was new was he rebutted reports in the press that he is still upset about how the Democratic Party shunted him aside. He said this, it's been my honor of my lifetime to serve as your president. I love the job, but I love my country more. All this talk about how I'm angry with all those people who said I should step down, that's not true. I love my country more and we need to preserve our democracy Unquote. But Kim, I agree that after having watched Biden for three and a half years as president and as a presidential candidate, there were big chunks of this speech that felt very familiar. I found myself saying, I think I saw him say that in 2020, or wasn't that in the State of the Union address recently? The finishing lines after he set them up because he has a habit of recycling the same lines, which I thought was a, a bit interesting. Maybe it's he likes those lines that way. And even if he's delivered them 50 times, what 51 is never going to hurt anybody. Or I wonder if it's because he is getting older and it's harder to get him to use a, a new phrasings and a fresh speech. But that brings up the other point, which is that I was looking for is how did he look? And it was a fine speech. It was not full of the kind of problems that we saw at the recent debate that prompted all of the Democratic alarm about Joe Biden's age and his health, his mental capacities. But he did look like an 80-something man. And I found myself wondering, Kim, you know, what if he had chosen not to drop out and we were watching this speech and they would have made sure it was in primetime then. It wouldn't have been at midnight, which would have helped. But if this was the speech that he had planned to deliver, and you can only imagine that he had started thinking about themes he was going to perhaps talk about at the Democratic National Convention, I think Democrats would be feeling that same sort of alarm that they felt in the days before they they finally convinced Joe Biden to step aside. It's an excellent point. Look, it was probably difficult for him, as we know, and he has admitted in his interviews, he he likes to go to bed a bit early. This all dragged on very late. He was giving this speech extremely late at night. I don't even know how many people would have caught it, given that it was no longer even in prime time, what we call prime time, when he finally got up there. He very much looked his age, and I think that would be sending alarm bells and panic through the ranks if he had decided not to get out. It's almost in some ways inconceivable now looking at him thinking that he was going to marshal on and go on to try to to win this election. I think a couple of other things, though, about his performance, as it were. One is it not full of joy, right? I mean, these are all the the headlines about the Kamala Harris campaign is uh, she's such a breath of fresh air and look, she's out there smiling and energetic. This was Joe Biden, I would say, of his State of the Union speech, where he can marshal a lot of energy in front of teleprompters, but it comes out kind of in a yell these days. That's how he operates. He seems a bit angry up there. So I appreciate your point about how he said, I'm not angry. But the rest of the delivery of the speech was very much at Joe Biden riled up on stage. And those seem to be his kind of only operating procedures. You either put him in front of a teleprompter and he half screams his lines, or he's sitting in an interview and he's struggling to remember facts and really having a difficulty getting through it, which we've seen in that interview he did with Stephanopoulos, but also with the debate. So 
I would have to imagine for many reasons people were sitting in that audience thinking, wow, we dodged a big one here. Mm -hmm. 